Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. In this video I'm going to be getting a bit theoretical, so like the disclaimer I always use in the beginning of the video, this shouldn't serve as medical advice. So now that my ass is covered, let's proceed. Recently two hair transplant surgeons, Dr. Barguthi and Dr. Bloxham, have been conducting hair transplants with the aid of a drug called vertiporfin. Vertiporfin is known as a yes associated protein inhibitor. It works by inhibiting or blocking a protein known as the yes associated protein, which is commonly called YAP. Now, vertiporfin was originally used to treat age related macular degeneration, an eye disease that creates new blood vessels within the eye, which over time causes degradation to vision and potentially leading to blindness. In order to treat this ocular disease, vertiporfin is injected into the vein of a patient. From there, vertiporfin travels systemically and reaches the eye. Here, vertiporfin is then activated with the aid of a specific wavelength of light beamed into the eye, which causes abnormal blood vessels in the eye to reduce their growth and leakage, thereby slowing vision loss and potentially saving the patient's eyesight. So what the hell does this have to do with hair transplants? Like, why are we talking about an eye disease and us getting back our hair or growing more hair. Well, vertiporfin, like I mentioned before, is known as a yes associated protein inhibitor, YAP. Now, YAP is a key component in the hippo signaling pathway. This is a pathway that is involved in controlling organ size and tissue regeneration by regulating cell proliferation, also known as cell growth, and apoptosis, also known as cell death. A paper in the prestigious science publication titled, quote, Preventing Engrailed 1 Activation in Fibroblast Yields Wound Regeneration Without Scarring, unquote, discusses the role of YAP in wound healing and scarring, particularly in relation to the activation of Engrailed 1 in fibroblasts. Engrailed 1, or EN1, is a gene that encodes a transcription factor involved in regulating cellular processes particularly in skin fibroblasts. It relates to YAP as YAP signaling influences the activation of EN1, which overall plays a key role in skin wound healing and scarring. And for the people who don't know, I will explain what a fibroblast is. Fibroblasts are just cells in connective tissues that produce collagen and other fibers, hence at least part of the name fibroblasts. And they play a crucial role in wound healing and tissue repair. Now, this particular paper shows how when mice are given deep wounds and treated with vertiporfin, scar formation is blocked and a much more slower healing process occurs. Here, in this healing process, hair grows back in what was once originally a deep wound that surely destroyed hair follicles. Here in these images, we can see the results of vertiporfin on wound healing in mice. Panel A captures the healing process of wounds where the inner ring has been treated with vertiporfin while the outer ring has not in the treatment group. The control group received no treatment shows only the formation of scar tissue. The images in panel A demonstrate that vertiporfin treatment leads to the regeneration of hair follicles and minimizes scarring, contrasting starkly with the untreated control wounds that heal by forming scar tissue. Now for the subsequent panels B and C, it presents histological sections and cellular level images that highlight the differences between the control and vertiporfin treated tissues, revealing the presence of regenerated skin structures such as hair follicles in the treated tissue. In panel F's graphs, we can see that it provides a quantitative analysis of these observations, with the bar graphs or histograms measuring the extent of hair follicle regeneration, scar tissue formation, and other relevant parameters. These graphs offer statistical evidence confirming the qualitative differences seen in the photographic and microscopic images. Panel H includes diagrams of biochemical pathways. These would map out the series of biochemical reactions within the cells that are affected by vertiporfin, possibly highlighting upregulated or downregulated genes or proteins that contribute to the healing process. And that particular gene would be the engrilled 1 or EN1 gene. 
The progression of the healing process over time, clearly showing that vertiporphin accelerates tissue regeneration compared to the untreated control. Likewise, in the paper, quote, inhibiting yes-associated protein prevents scarring and promotes regeneration in a large animal model of wound repair, unquote. Heather E. Talbot and colleagues demonstrate how using vertiporphin after a deep tissue wound, specifically in red duroc pigs, reduced scarring and induced regenerative healing. Now, you're probably thinking that these studies don't translate well to humans because, well, <laughs> we aren't pigs or mice. However, mammals, which includes us humans, generally scar the same due to shared characteristics in skin structure, healing processes, and genetic pathways. Most mammals have comparable skin anatomy, with an epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous layers, which includes skin appendages like hair follicles. The scarring process involves a conserved sequence of healing phases, meiostasis, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling that are driven by collagen production, and general tissue remodeling, which is a function that's primarily carried out by fibroblast cells. Additionally, the inflammatory response, which is crucial for initiating healing and fighting infection, is a common feature across mammalian species. Despite these similarities, there are specific species variations in healing rates and scarring intensity due to genetic, physiological, and anatomy differences. So you can expect some mammals having less scarring, where other animals have more scarring. So if anything, if vertiporphin is shown to be working in mice and pigs, it could be that the dose that is used in mice and pigs could be higher or lower than what we would use in humans. We don't know. We have to determine this with further research, surely. So let's go back to those two doctors that I mentioned before, Dr. Barguthi and Dr. Bloxham. Dr. Berguthi and Dr. Bloxham are conducting their own separate vertiporphin clinical trials, and this has resulted in valuable information, not just in hair transplantation methods, but overall, the field of dermatology. Now, before I remind you about what these doctors are doing and what they've seen in terms of results in their clinical trials, I think we need to have a quick recap on the subject and procedure of hair transplantation. When you're doing a hair transplant, you have generally two regions. The donor region, where hair follicles are extracted from, and within the context of androgenetic alopecia, these hair follicles are not sensitive or minimally sensitive to DHT. And then you have the recipient region. This is the thinning area or bald area where donor hair is transplanted to. The donor region usually develops scar tissue after hair follicles are extracted. The reason for this is due to how deep in the skin the surgeon must puncture in order to acquire the scalp tissue that contains these hair follicles. According to Safet Ors in a paper titled, quote, Follicular Unit Extraction, FUE, Hair Transplantation, unquote, the extraction of hair follicles requires penetrating deep into the skin, typically ranging from 3 millimeters to 3.5 millimeters. Now, this scarring will happen whether the surgeon uses the FUT or FUE methods. FUT, or the follicular unit transplantation, also known as the strip method, requires that a thin strip of scalp is removed from the back of a patient's head and divided into pieces called grafts. Now, within the strip method, you can find numerous numbers of hair follicles, and each hair follicle, or graft, can produce anywhere between one to five hairs. In the FUE, or the follicular unit extraction, it involves the individual extraction of follicular units, each containing, again, anywhere between one to five hairs, from the donor area of the patient's scalp. Now, both of these methods cause deep tissue trauma to the scalp and results in different scarring patterns. The FUE scarring pattern typically looks like dots where the hair follicles were extracted from in the donor area. The FUT scarring presents in the donor area as a line comparable to the length of extraction. So you'll have this, you know, sometimes it's rather sightly, this large line that is present in the donor area. Now, in Dr. Barguthi's trial, nearly one and a half years in length now, we see that the patients who underwent hair transplants and had vertiporphin immediately injected into the site of the donor region are beginning to grow hair follicles in these areas. And keep in mind, these areas should 
have been replaced with scar tissue. This is not typical. So it's likely that this is the cause of vertiporfin. Now, Dr. Barguthi uses the same patient and essentially has two sites. One area where hair follicles were extracted via FUE, and in that particular area, vertiporfin was treated. So this is called the vertiporfin treated area. And on the same patient, there's another site where hair follicles were extracted. And this site is supposed to be used as a control to compare how different the healing process is. And in the non-treated site, the site that did not have vertiporfin injected immediately into it, or at all, you can see that there aren't any hair follicles growing. In fact, there's scar tissue. So when you compare the treated area versus the untreated area, you can see that clearly in the treated area, there is a regeneration of hair follicles and minimal scarring. Likewise, in Dr. Bloch's Ham's own clinical trials, you can see comparable results where you have a slow healing process and some hair follicle regeneration. Now, this definitely warrants further research. If anything, a large clinical trial. And more doctors should definitely jump in on this. But this leaves me with a question. Could we just use microneedling? Like, is it really necessary for somebody to sit down in a chair and have a hair follicle extracted, right? Because we know that from the animal studies as well as now, Dr. Bloxham and Dr. Barguthi's case reports on real human subjects, that all that's needed is a sufficient amount of skin trauma that can induce scarring. So in this context, it would be a hair transplant or wound going 3.5 millimeters to 4 millimeters in depth, just, you know, matching it up with the FUE and FUT depth procedures. And then, vertiporfin being applied afterwards. So what I'm trying to say is, could we just microneedle at that 3.5 millimeter to four millimeter depth range and then inject vertiporfin or apply vertiporfin topically to that microneedled area? In theory, one could induce similar results that we've seen in Dr. Bloxham and Dr. Barguthi's clinical trials. Now, I'm not saying go out there and get a derma stamp or a doctor pen or some sort of microneedle and, and needling your scalp between 3.5 to four millimeters. First off, that's painful. And although the case reports and animal models look very promising, you have a lot of things to contend with, like sterile environments, making sure that the solutions themselves are sterile. If the microneedles that you're using are even clean enough to be doing that, if your scalp's clean, if you're in a clean room, there's so many potentials for infection here. But continuing with the theory, if this is done in an area of the scalp that is bald or miniaturizing, we can expect to see similar hair follicle regeneration or stimulation, right? After all, we know that in end-stage androgenetic alopecia, hair follicles are sufficiently suppressed by DHT to the point where they enter in this sort of dormant state where they're either producing mini vellus hairs or producing no hairs at all. And ultimately, in the site of these hair follicles, they are replaced with scar tissue. It could be that vertiporfin along with Deep tissue trauma is the answer in waking up and or regenerating these hair follicles. Now, that's just a potential pathway of treatment that I can see some lay adventurous biohacker doing one day, or perhaps being conducted in some sort of clinical practice. Again, I think there are some considerations. Right now, we don't have that many subjects to conclusively state what dose of vertiporfin would be adequate in healing hair follicles and or causing tissue to regenerate. I also want to revisit the notion of sterility. That is how clean our environment is, how clean our instruments are, how clean is the topical solution that we're going to be applying to our scalp, and in general, just how we can prevent infection from bacteria. One of the many reasons why we scar is because it is evolutionarily advantageous in mammals to prevent things like infections when we are wounded. In other non-mammalian animals, which are capable of tissue regeneration, this process typically occurs slowly. Although they do regain functionality of whole limbs, like the famous axolotl or starfish, this slower regeneration process leaves them very open to infections. Likewise, using vertiporfin to stop yap and create a slower healing process that essentially regenerates an organ, because in case you don't know, the hair follicle itself is a mini organ, could possibly pose patients in a similar risk 
of infection if the utmost care is not taken. Again, we have to preach about having a clean environment with clean tools and sterile solutions of vertiporphin, as well as a means of preventing infections to the areas that have deep tissue trauma. Now, this would be a very interesting proposal because assuming you can prevent infections and such, and assuming that vertiporphin can be compounded into a specific topical concentration that's found to help reduce YAP and have the healing process be a bit more prolonged, we can potentially see what Dr. Barguthi and Dr. Bloxham's case reports are showing. And I want to say this, humans, when they're developing as fetuses, have similar regeneration capabilities. We only lose that sometime in the latter end of the fetal development. So when we're born, if we have some sort of trauma on the skin, and if that trauma is deep enough, scarring may be induced. But then again, there are other factors like old age. It has been shown, at least in mice, and potentially this could be translated over to humans, that age may be a factor in wound healing, such that the older you get, the less prevalent scars become, and also occurs. But that's pretty much it for this video. I want to reiterate, this video shouldn't serve as any, you know, medical advice, so do not take it as such. If you do it, you're doing it on your own. I'm not going to advocate for you going out there and microneedling your, your scalp at 3.5 to 4 millimeters. That is painful. So to be clear, I'm not advocating for you to do that. But really, this video should serve as a potential opening for a longer, maybe not so long, but a more in-depth video where I go into the technicals of the healing process as well as looking at some case reports. I want to bring up that one case where the old man was sitting by the fire, he fell in the fire, burnt his scalp, and then he regrew back his, I guess, juvenile hairline or some shit. God, when I said that out loud, it sounded like some sort of nursery rhyme. The old man sitting by a fire fell off from his rocking chair and burnt his scalp and grew his hair. I think we can get that to be a poem. But yeah, <laughs> comment in the comment section below, new hair if you got this far. Be sure to check out the description for my Discord server, as well as scheduling for my hair loss consultation service, where I give you my non-medical, non-clinical advice in what I would do in a situation like yours. Anyway, hope to see you guys in the next video. Peace out.